Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we're going to be looking at episode 19, I believe it is, of Command, or Commander, uh, The Great War. Uh, in the last series, we continued our advanced east and eastern Prussia, destroying several more Russian units. Romania joined the war against us, and our Italian offensive continued to gain ground. Meanwhile, the Allies on the Western Front are showing renewed vigor, continuing to attack our forces and inflicting unacceptable casualties on our troops there, something that is probably... Uh, a we're, we're in some dangerous shape right now on the Western Front. Um, they're not breaking out yet but they're it seems they're on the verge with the with the amount of air power they have and how effective it has been at uh, basically cutting off or, or not cutting off but disrupting and allowing the enemy to uh, advance and destroy our troops there you see a devastating naval battle there as the french destroy that uh, austrian cruiser uh, which perhaps got a little bit too uh, far from austrian territory here in the adriatic meanwhile the russians advancing uh, near I believe that's Karakov uh, in the Caucasus against the Ottomans, um, continuing to advance further away from its line of supply, so that probably wasn't the smartest move by the Russians there. might open up a potential counterattack for us here. Meanwhile, on the uh, other eastern front uh, between the Russians, Romanians, and then the Bulgarians, Ottomans, and Austrians, uh, things are somewhat stagnant, moving somewhat slowly after some Russian reverses near Budapest. Um, the Romanians, meanwhile, uh, while cut off and surrounded there, um, are really no, uh, no worse for the wear because you can't cut off and destroy units in a capital. They will always have supply if they have a clear line with a capital city, that being the cities with the star. So that kind of sucks. Um, we do have one Romanian unit isolated, but uh, nothing too substantial. And uh, the Russians continue to kind of, I don't know if they're falling back or counterattacking, it's hard to say, uh, on the, the Prussian front. Um, yeah, Italian front. Uh, you can see there the uh, Allies have some air power that they've diverted from the Western Front there. You can see two air units. Uh, the Germans are in trouble in that they don't have enough industrial points to commit to building air units while the Allies do because I really haven't been launching any commerce raids, no U-boat raids against uh, against the Allies like I should. Holy cow, and there you saw it. four air units and one artillery unit and a Allied breakthrough driving that unit back. We'll see if they uh, exploit that hole in my line and advance into it, or if they content themselves merely with inflicting heavy casualties on a garrison unit. Looks to be the latter. Uh, so yeah, everything's going really well for us, with the exception of the Western Front, where things are now starting to get dicey. Um, more technological developments, and again, very little. Oh, holy cow, Germany, 124 industries. So um, the question is, do we use it to shore up our defensive line, which is... Uh, severely lacking due to heavy casualties, or do we use it to um, build new units? Probably the latter would be wise, but um, it's also a rare opportunity for us to essentially shore up quite a few uh, understrength units in the east that are exhausted after constant combat and offensive and heavy defensive operations. So I guess we'll see what we do there uh, as we attempt to continue to keep the pressure on the Russians here in late 1916. Now in my last video I talked a little bit about the Battle of the Somme uh, and kind of the um, perhaps slightly misinterpreted uh, engagement that took place in 1916 around this time period. Not that it was misinterpreted from being a disaster, because in a large degree it was a disaster for uh, the Allied powers in the West, the, Ent the Entente powers. However, despite being a disaster, especially early, there were a lot of lessons, there were a lot of signs that the war was beginning to change already in 1916. The battle saw the first wide-scale use of tanks, by the uh, by the British and also saw some changing tactics in the way artillery was used after the initial phase of the battle focused primarily on massive bombardments uh, 1916 is interesting to me because while I think it was early was it early six no it was 1915 when the Germans launched their massively successful offensive against the Russians the what was that called again 
the Gorlich Tarnow Offensive or something like that, which drove the Russians about 180 miles east of Warsaw. Uh, whatever this current offensive we're in the middle of with the Germans is probably comparable to that offensive right now. We've destroyed tons of Russian units, although we haven't driven them back nearly as far. Uh, but nonetheless, that Gorlich Tarnow Offensive, which I believe took place in 1915, convinced the German High Command that the Russians were all but done and uh, was a major reason that they decided to uh, launch their offensive against Verdun rather than focusing on finishing up the Russians in the east. The Verdun offensive disrupted some Allied offensive plans in the west and ended up leading to the Battle of the Somme as an attempt to relieve pressure on the, uh, r the French units which were being attacked by the Germans. It led to the British first major attack. It also led to a Russian attack in 1916 as well, the most successful Russian offensive of the entire war. That was in large part a response to the Battle of Verdun and an attempt to bring German pressure off of the um, off of the French, but it was also an attempt to relieve some pressure off of the Italians who had entered the war on the Entente or Allied Powers side. Um, there was a heavy Austrian offensive against the Italians in early 1916, as well as the German attacks near Verdun, uh, which led to the Italians asking the Russians to launch a attack against the the Germans, or not the Germans, but against the. Uh, the Central Powers. Some initial attacks against the Germans bogged down early in 1916, and uh, Russian commanders had very little faith, very little confidence that their attacks would come to anything and have any chance of success, with one exception that was General Brusilov, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing his name, who decided to launch a heavy attack against the Austrians instead of the Germans in the south. And uh, the attack went remarkably well. The Brusilov Offensive saw the Russians advance hundreds of miles, uh, breaking through the Austrian lines, imperiling the Austrian position, and seriously threatening the Austro-Hungarian Empire's ability to continue the war. It was a dramatic success in which the Russians borrowed a lot of tactics which were being implemented um, by other powers, and again was a sign that the static war, which so... Um, epitomizes the First World War and is so remembered for the First World War, again, was already breaking down in 1916. Although, to be fair, uh, there was never quite the level of, uh, of staticity. <laughs> there was never quite the level of stagnation on the uh, Eastern Front as there was on the Western Front. Still, things had settled down before the Brusilov Offensive, which took place in June of 1916, but didn't actually end until October-ish. So right around the time that we're in right now uh, would have been when the Brusilov Offensive was wrapping up. The Russians uh, decided rather than concentrating massive quantities of troops in a very narrow area, as was the, the rule in the West, they would have a more uh, dispersed offensive, you know, bringing troops in massive quantities of artillery up and being ready, but also uh, not giving away the location of their attack. Um, and I believe it, uh, I believe the, the, despite, oh no, that was, that was the Somme, never mind. But, um, Nonetheless, they did disperse their forces a lot more, uh, which allowed them to help hide the location of the attack and uh, not give away exactly what they were up to. The Russians broke through the Austrian lines and were rapidly racing through uh, the uh, the Russian line or Austrian lines. Uh, however, the eventual downfall of the Brusilov offensive was not any particular blunder by the Russians or an in incapability of the Russians to continue the offensive from a military standpoint. The Russians executed brilliantly, and Brusilov himself uh, covered himself in glory. Rather, the, the ending, uh, as you can see here, I'm choosing to upgrade my troops to make them more effective in the hope that upgrading my troops will allow them to better withstand these massive allied counterattacks. I'm doing that rather than actually launching or actually purchasing more units. And that may be a mistake, but that's what I'm doing anyway. Um, but anyway, Brusilov's offensive bogged down uh, for two reasons. One, the Germans came to the Austrian aid, and actually it was a critical turning point in the war in the sense that the Austrians finally agreed uh, to follow German direction rather than kind of their own command structure. Uh, the offensive was so disastrous that the Austrians essentially agreed to take uh, a back seat to the Germans in terms of command on the Eastern Front. Um, but it also uh, failed because, well, not also, but it failed 
for two reasons. One, the Russian infrastructure was incapable of supporting the continued drive and rapid advance. Railroads couldn't keep up, supplies couldn't keep up, and eventually the Russians outstripped their supply lines. Uh, the Germans also dispatched large numbers of troops to aid the Austrians, and as the Russians reached the end of their supply lines, they were now facing expert German troops as well as Austrian troops who were battle-hardened and falling back on their own supply lines who were much better in supply. The offensive ended, um, as as many offensives in World War I ended, much like the German spring offensives, uh, with desperate attempts by the Russians to keep the front mobile with suicidal, heavy casualty attacks, uh, which bogged down into nothing. And despite the massive uh, gain in terms of uh, successful, you know, gain of land, uh, the Russian army uh, while meeting with initial success, perhaps the end of the offensive was bungled to the point that morale dropped. It failed in destroying the Austrians, allowed them to consolidate, allowed the Germans to consolidate, and really set the stage uh, with massive Russian casualties, especially at the end of that offensive, like I said, uh, really set the stage for uh, the Russian Revolution to really begin and to see Lenin return to Russia um, and uh, basically, this was the last major attack, last major hurrah for the Russian military uh, in the First World War, where everything really went to crap after that. But uh, as you can see here, the Russians are starting to fortify uh, a line uh, near is that Danzig, I believe, starting to fortify a line along the Danzig corridor. So our chance for a rapid breakthrough into the east may be uh, quickly fading. Meanwhile, our Western Front has been shuffling troops back and forth. We've upgraded troops in the hope of better withstanding these massive Allied attacks. As you can see here, the Allied computer is taking pains to attack only our core units, so not our infantry, not our full-size units. They're attacking weak spots along the line. So I've got to give the AI a lot of credit for that. They're doing a good job of finding the spot where we're the weakest, concentrating against it, destroying it, and eventually they're going to wear me out. You know, I lost a unit, or didn't lose it, but lost 90% of a unit, and it was driven back this last turn. Now this turn on the 26th of October, another unit lost more than 50% of its strength for virtually no allied losses, still held its ground, but eventually these casualties are going to be uh, too heavy, too hard for me to, to replace the losses. So things are starting to look a little bit grave. Meanwhile, on the eastern front, the situation is the same. We've pocketed a Russian unit, and in the process of destroying it, uh, are losing valuable time to try and exploit Russia's fragmented uh, situation. We're basically cutting off Russian units, but then it takes too long to destroy them uh, before we are uh, forced to, um, it, or before we're able to advance again. Uh, you can see here the Russians have formed a seemingly solid line uh, south, and uh, we've now run into you can see there the three of those unit, four of those units along the line of the five we can see are full strength infantry units. So uh, we may be about to bog down into trench warfare. Unfortunately, once again, right around Danzig. Meanwhile, with the Russians holding the port city of Danzig itself, we're not able to bombard it because that port hex is in Russian control. So it's going to limit the use of our navy along the Baltic coast, which has been very useful. Meanwhile, we'll continue to. Uh, reduce at least this one Romanian unit here that's cut off near Arad um, and is frustratingly not dying as they inflict much heavier casualties on us than they on them, uh, which is pretty much disastrous. Meanwhile, we have cut off and now destroyed another Russian unit to the south of, I believe that's Karakov. It's hard for me to see here. But it looks like the Russians have brought in yet another full strength unit. So they have finally given the Ottomans the attention they probably should have quite a while ago. Um, and uh, we're now going up, not against the bulk of the Russian army by any means, but certainly a substantial force, uh, which is going to pose a challenge for the Ottoman army here. Uh, to deal with as we really lack the, the resources to reinforce these guys in any kind of meaningful way. You can see here the Ottoman industry produces very little 
in terms of industrial points, and we probably have tied up far too many of those points in, uh, in a larger military than we should have. Maybe we shouldn't have recruited quite so many men at the start of the war and kind of kept a smaller force. That way the industrial points uh, would have had, we would have had more for reinforcements as opposed to paying huge amounts to troops, you know, for upkeep. But uh, that is neither here nor there. You know, I'm not going to disband soldiers in the field either. So uh, that's kind of where we're at there. You can see here the Romanian front is kind of stabilizing, unfortunately, here. I'd like to take Bucharest, but we just don't have the manpower right now and uh, kind of pull this one unit back to protect the Bulgarian capital if the Russians try anything silly. They're not Russians, but Romanians. So we've got new heavy artillery. That's nice. Meanwhile, on the western front... We could just bombard someone for the heck of it. The AI is also doing a really good job of making sure that the places along the front where it does have uh, garrison units rather than full strength units, um, it's only exposed to one or two attacks at the most. I have not done as good of a job um, creating my front line, really. Let's see here, trying to shore up the line here near Metz. Uh, I could advance toward Dijon with these two units. There's a a hole at the end of the Allied line. Their flank is in the air, but the problem with that is I don't have enough troops that can exploit that. I'd need to shift troops away from the Italian front, which is another area of opportunity for me uh, where things have been going much better, although I'm worried that we're getting in a similar situation as the Russians in the Bruce Lowe offensive, which I was just discussing, where most of our units are well below full strength, so I'm just kind of worried that we're going to exhaust ourselves and not be able to um, finish the offensive, which has started so well here. As you can see, we destroy another allied unit on the Italian front. We do have a gap on our the flank of our line. Hopefully the French don't see fit to exploit it. They have two units across from it, but a garrison unit which is horribly disorganized and probably would pro would be in trouble if it tried to attack, and an army unit which is guarding a city right now, not likely to evacuate that as it would endanger its own flank and, and risk itself being cut off. I'd like to shift some troops to the Italian front as it seems the front is more um, open for maybe some success so we'll see here. I will say the one thing I've done well with the Austrians, it seems to me, I've, I've done a decent job of at least making sure I get enough industrial points for the Austrians to replace their losses fairly effectively. The Austrian troops in large part are uh, pretty close to full strength. Actually, Austria-Hungary has surpassed Germany in terms of the amount of manpower remaining. Uh, that might be a bit concerning as we've really been bleeding heavily as, uh, as the Germans really carrying carrying a lot of these offensives with the Germans, while the Austrians have, have largely, the Russians haven't been attacking them too aggressively. So the Austrian manpower is pretty strong as we uh, are now past the halfway mark, uh, which we got to in our last video. The halfway mark in terms of the total number of possible turns uh, was 59, so we're up to turn 62, probably about to jump into turn 63 here uh, before too long. Could attempt to attack this French battleship, which destroyed our uh, destroyed our cruiser there. We'll go ahead and do that and inflict a casualty on them, but I don't think I'm not going to use the battleship there. I don't have anyone to bombard along the Italian coast, unfortunately. Um, it'd be nice to be able to use this heavy artillery for this navy. This navy artillery is heavy artillery to you know continue the drive south. That is one positive. If you can control the Adriatic, it really does make your offensives in Italy much stronger, much easier because you know the allies are have a hard time uh, forming a cohesive line and preventing you from breaking through their flank on one side Arda should should fall next turn meanwhile i'm not sure uh, we might reach a stalemate here in kharkov where the russians have an artillery unit heavy artillery unit and two army units at the least they may be bringing in more reserves so it's it's hard to see and our troops are uh, exhausted without sufficient reserves. You know, the Ottomans don't get enough manpower per turn to replace these guys. It could take almost half a season to replace these guys. So 
And that's another realistic aspect in this game is that that idea of you know, taking heavy casualties and then needing quite a bit of time uh, to build yourself back up and, and you know, replace your losses. Uh, definitely seeing that effect on the Ottomans after a very successful offensive into the heart of Russia, taking key cities like Sevastopol and uh, Stalin. Well, not it's Stalingrad in World War II. I don't know what, what is it called today. I think it's Tsarostan before, um, you know, the Tsar city or whatever. Um, the Romanians joined the war, but they haven't been too aggressive, apart from a few isolated areas where they had had some opportunities. And uh, just as I say that, of course, they launch an attack against against the flank of our line in Austria. We've got all these troops tied up in this defensive line that seems like they're really not doing much of anything but sitting there in the trenches with a few isolated incidents here. You can see the Russians shifting some troops away from Premzel. Um, we've almost got a cohesive line for the first time in the war, I think, uh, between the, uh, the Austrian and German fronts. So uh, definitely you can tell manpower is coming up, uh, coming up uh, pretty heavy there as the uh, Allied aircraft here shift maybe more to Italy with two air units uh, bombarding that one unit in Italy. But nope, because apparently the Allies still have tons of troops here in uh, in France and they drive our troops south of Strasbourg from their positions and uh, shift their lines so another allied breakthrough uh, in our lines the western front situation with all these combined arms offensives tying up air units heavy artillery units and infantry units is feeling much more like uh, just the aftermath of the spring offensives in 1918 uh, rather than uh, rather than 1916, unfortunately. Again, I've not been doing a good job of uh, making sure my forces are well supplied with a wide variety of weapons. Right now you're seeing the penalties uh, that you're going to run into if you focus strictly on an infantry-based unit. Um, definitely makes some sense. As you've seen, I've been able to maintain an offense, you know, been able to basically maintain and hold Berlin against quite a bit of pressure, largely because of those investments. But uh, as the war kind of gets into its mid to later stages at this point, um, it's starting to, starting to hurt me quite a bit. <sighs> Here we are into November now. Turn 63. Finish off Kerch. So the Crimea is now Ottoman. Take that, Vladimir Putin. Um, let's see here. I don't know if I, I... These two Russian units, for whatever reason, aren't next to each other. I don't know if there's any way for me to try and cut them off. Interesting. I probably don't have enough units to launch another one of those flanking maneuvers, which has really helped me in previous attacks to get around um, Russian units and surround them and destroy them. My units aren't strong enough at this point, really, here in the, in the Caucasus region. Italian front seems to be the only front with any kind of promise, and even then the Allies have uh, deployed significant modern air forces against us there, and our troops are really, yikes, really exhausted here at this point. Let's see here, armored cars I like to attack because they don't, they're not too much of a threat, I don't think. So we kind of form one cohesive line here on the Italian front and reinforce some of these guys. Having much more success driving south into Italy than historically with the fall of Venice and driving toward Florence. Venice may have fallen, I believe, during kind of the 1917 German offensive against the Italians, which kind of prepped the way for the spring 1918 offensives uh, where the, the Germans tested out a lot of their stormtrooper and new kind of offensive techniques and had a lot of success in Italy until the Allies, I think the Western Allies, the French and British deployed something like 30 divisions basically to save the Italian front. May have to start reconsidering pulling troops back toward toward, toward Germany. I don't want to have to go with that strategic redeployment that happened historically 
so early in the war, but we might have to do that. The fortunate thing is right now our army's morale and strength is strong enough, our national will is strong enough, that such a redeployment won't lead to a total collapse like it did in 1918 uh, when the Germans had to redeploy to try and per protect Germany's homeland. The problem is when they did that, their lines just kind of fell apart. Massive numbers of, of troops began surrendering. You really had a just a complete disintegration of the German military toward the end of World War I with that. Um, uh, we can pull these guys back, maybe put these guys in against Antwerp so the uh, they're faced off against another core unit, although I'm sure the AI will recognize that and shift large troops against them. Still, they might be out of the range of the Allied air power kind of in central France. Move some artillery down here to the south to aid if the Allies do launch an attack against us. Hopefully the artillery will be in the right places. There we go. And uh, hoping to flank the Russians there turns out to be a bad, bad, bad hope here. As you can see, the Russian line extends south toward Warsaw. So uh, this Russian line is doesn't seem to have its flank in the air. Although, you know, flanking is a little bit overrated in this game in that uh, you don't seem to benefit too much if you get troops all around an enemy unit. Mainly it's about cutting their supply off. That's about it. So you can see here, there is a gap in the Russian lines in the south. So we could continue advancing. There is a slight gap between our two forces here right now, with this one Russian unit preventing us from closing, closing that gap up. But we've at least found the end of the Russian line. Maybe we can work our way up around it. <sighs> so, for those of you watching, I am going to try and um, start posting videos on a more regular schedule. I've done a couple of videos for thewargamer.com lately, and uh, between school starting back up for the semester, Scourge of War testing taking up quite a bit of time, uh, and you know, some real life issues as well. Uh, haven't had a whole lot of time to make videos, definitely not as much as I would like. I really enjoy it, but despite all of that, January looks to be, well, at the time of this recording, it's what, January 28th right now. It's on pace of being, if not the biggest month in terms of views for my channel, very close. If it is the biggest month, uh, then essentially, you know, it'll, it'll continue a trend that started in October, of 40,000 plus view months, um, almost got to 50,000 once. I think that was November, maybe it was December. Um, either November or December, I got like 49,900 49, views, which was, by, which was my best month ever. The month before it was like 46,000, and the month before that was like 41,000. Those are the only months I've ever had more than 40,000, so uh, quite a bit of growth. This month might actually surpass and get to like 51, 52,000, depending on how a few things pan out. Uh, if not, it'll be, you know, mid to upper 40s again. Um, YouTube views are, are trailing a bit, so it's hard to tell where I'm really at. But anyway, the point of that is that um, things have been going well for the channel, and I appreciate it, you guys. And uh, that was obviously a mistake there to fly the balloons in there as the Allied air power, which they have in the region, just decimated my, uh, my Zeppelins. Uh, that represents another strategical change between early war Zeppelins being largely impervious to enemy counter air and, and being very effective uh, units. In this case, they were not, and they got shot to pieces there. Uh, meanwhile, the Russian encirclement of Konigsberg has gotten weaker, so the guys there can at least uh, provide some distraction for the Russian troops opposite of them, as the Russians have shifted the bulk of the troops surrounding Konigsberg uh, toward um, the Danzig front. Unfortunately, I don't have any other troops in Konigsberg to take advantage of that, and if I move my one unit out, Konigsberg will fall and they'll be cut off and disaster will ensue, so we're not going to do that. Meanwhile, we're exhausted in Italy um, without, without much ability to counter. Again, I've got a decent amount of industry right now as Germany here, but I'm going to have to use, well, not have to, but I'm going to choose to use the majority of these points here to uh, upgrade these troops, hopefully making them more effective. 
Uh, the main downside of doing that is, again, that I won't be able to afford any nicer units than maybe just infantry. But my troops are so under-upgraded right now. They're so, they need to be caught up because uh, the allied units are also upgrading as well, just as quickly as, as they get new units. So it's really becoming an industrial battle, which it feels we're kind of in a death spiral and are going to lose. But it's hard to say. You know, the war is going well enough right now. If we can hang on in the West, maybe we can finish off the Russians and free up a lot of troops to head West. But we'll see. Um, with that being said, I think we're just about done with this video. This was part 19 of my Commander the Great War series. Again, looking to get back to this more regularly. Regularly, I also already have part 20 recorded, which will be a more conventional, less kind of historical discussion like I've done here the last two videos, talking more about gameplay as I play through it. I hope you've, I hope you've enjoyed this video, you guys. Thanks for tuning in once again. And until next time, this is the Historical Gamer saying bye.